on the side of the uh, fishing grounds where these guys were very um, familiar. I'm still, I'm trying to, there it is, it's, it's recording. Okay, so this, the wreck of the Minotaur was really about using formal elements, line, color, shape. Here, the light colors signify hope. Here, the darkness signifies the almost certain death of these guys, these poor schmucks that got stuck on this boat that's getting bashed to pieces. But it's using formal elements to convey not only a sense of hope, but a sense of the sublime. It really came to a head when Turner tied himself to a mast of a ship and in the middle of a snowstorm, and he almost died, probably eventually did die of pneumonia. But what he found out by tying himself to the ship that he really found out what a, a storm really felt like. Here's an image of a storm from based on physical experience. And here he's sitting in his nice comfortable studio in London guessing at what a storm must feel like to be in. He gets all the details right, but he misses the truth. Here, he doesn't care about details at all. He barely gives us any details. Here, there's a paddle wheel side of the steamship, a mast, a flag, a smokestack, but no details. It's not about details, it's about truth. It's about the real essence, the sublime. Van Gogh used that spiral composition to make his definitive statement about the way the world really looks, not the way it appears to our eye. And Starry Night has been, somebody pointed out last time that this was done from his hospital room, his asylum room. Um, it may well have been, but it wasn't about being crazy as a lot of people suspect. I suspect this is one of the sanest paintings that's ever been done to somebody who's really tightly wrapped. It looks crazy. But to somebody who really looks deeper into the universe, it looks like the statement of truth. Same with Monet's Les Nymphes, Les Nymphes, N-A-N-Y-M-P-H-A-E-A-S, Les Nymphes, uh, the water lilies, giant paintings that were so almost abstract, they showed this reflection of the sky and the water. And the only thing that gives you any sense that it's not a pure abstraction is the lily pads here that, that are so receding into the distance. There's a sense of perspective and you understand that what you're looking at is the surface of the water and the reflection, just the reflection of the clouds as color. The Ballad of the Jealous Lover of jo Lonesome Green Valley uses line and color to create a nightmare. It's America, it's like a folk song. It's like a country and Western song. Here, the jealous lover stabbed his girlfriend in the heart. And here in the foreground, paying no attention to what's going on behind them is the artist playing his violin. This guy either playing the harmonica or rolling a joint, I'm not sure. And here, Jackson Pollock, the great artist, student of Thomas Hart Benton is actually sitting here drinking his probably moonshine whiskey. So what it is, is taking the elements of line, color, form, and space and turning them into a myth, turning them into a legend. The archetype of the jealous lover, the isolated artist, this guy playing the fiddle, well, he could be standing on a mountaintop overlooking the clouds, standing apart from the flow of nature, which Thomas Hart Benton has now made to look like a dream or a nightmare. Vasily Kandinsky basically wrote a book called Concerning the Spiritual and Art. And he wrote in that book that he was now making art on purpose that was abstract. Art didn't have to look like anything. It just had to look like something. It had to be a thing, not a reflection, not a depiction of something else. So for Kandinsky, line, color, form, and shape, the formal elements are the meaning itself. That's the, what gives the art the meaning. It doesn't have to look like something, it just has to be something. So composition seven was one of his early abstract painting, purely non-objective, finding the reality rather than the appearance. He thought that it, appearances can be deceiving, but if you find the essence, ultimately it's not a question of what your eye sees, it's what your soul sees. 
Georgia O'Keeffe really felt the same way. She did Blue Flower in 1918, an early abstract painting in America. And people thought it was a dirty painting. They thought it was a picture of female genitals. And she said, no, 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 it's a picture of a flower. It's an abstraction that's inspired by how I feel when I look at beautiful flowers. And yes, it has connection to the sensual, to the sexual. It gets to the basis of human existence, but it's not a picture of anything. It's an abstraction. Most important, Music in Pink and Blue by Georgia O'Keeffe raises art to the level of music. What is a great symphony supposed to sound like? We don't imagine it's supposed to look like you know, somebody walking down the street, a great symphony goes beyond appearances. Well, that's what Georgia O'Keeffe and by the way, Vasily Kandinsky wanted art to become. So here you've got this beautifully painted, fairly small painting using soft colors, beautiful edges, wonderful composition and an exciting contrast of actually complementary colors, red and green, um, are the dominant factors, but she said it's music in pink and blue. So here's the blue and here's the pink. These are color, colors which might be dissonant. They might be um, difficult to see in the same thing, but she's used shades of pink and say shades of orange, shades of green to make it a beautiful harmonious a uh, very sensuous painting that doesn't depict anything. This isn't a picture of flowers. It's a picture of music. Jackson Pollock, 50 years later, comes along and he makes Convergence, which is one of his action paintings. And Pollock basically uses color, sometimes not much color, uh, but in here uses really bright colors that he just drips onto a big canvas. Again, it's about eight feet by 12 feet, gigantic painting. So he leans over it and he carries coffee cans, empty coffee cans full of paint. And he just puts his brush in and throws the brush into the paint and then drips the paint out of the surface. And everybody thought at first he was playing a joke. And they said, well, you know, are, are you trying to tell us about natural forces? And famous Pollock said, I'm not making pictures about natural forces. I'm nature. I am nature. I am a force of nature. And so are you. And so am I. Adolf Gottlieb, a friend of Jackson Pollock's, they were both largely um, considered to be really arrogant and really obnoxious guys, and really into their sort of their artwork and their genius. Blast One was Gottlieb's masterpiece. And after this, every painting he did for the next 20 years, the rest of his life, was really a variation on this theme, the circle in the sky and the really gestural, almost messy kind of use of black brushes, inspired by Zen Buddhism, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the subtext in Gottlieb's work, which he never quite admitted, everybody assumed was about nuclear holocaust. In 1957, Everybody in New York City where Gottlieb lived thought the Russians were gonna drop a bomb on us. And this was about his terror and his ecstasy, at the idea of mass destruction, the sublime, something that's so terrifying that it's beautiful, something that's so beautiful that it's terrifying. The modern sublime was picked up by Mark Rothko who killed himself the year I went to art school, 1970. Rothko killed himself. He basically sold five paintings to a group of Swiss bankers who came to his studio and for a million dollars, and this was 1970, 1969, um, Rothko sold five paintings for a million dollars, which was considered outrageously a lot of money. All of his work now is worth at least 20 million each. But at the time, it was, it was considered outrageous. They came, they chose their five paintings. They came back a week later. He had, was supposed to have had them all put into crates and ready for them to ship back to Switzerland. Instead, Rothko met them at the door of the studio in his underwear with a glass of scotch. And he's sobbing, said, get the hell out of my studio, you bastards. You can't have my children. And he backed out of the whole deal. 
take your million dollars and go back to, Sw to Switzerland. And they did, but, and Rothko killed himself about three months later. But his idea of the sublime was in these paintings. And he didn't do anything except use color and paint to make these soft edges, to make these gigantic forms. Again, about eight feet wide and 10 feet high. And it's just called pink and eggplant. The Rothko Chapel is a shrine to the sublime. It's a, it's a temple, um, a cathedral, a, a chapel that is used by every religious denomination. There are Buddhist ceremonies and Hindu ceremonies and Muslim ceremonies, Jewish bar mitzvahs are held in here, Christian weddings are held in here, funerals, everything, everything that requires that connection to the spiritual, to the noumenal, to the metaphysical side of things takes place in the space. His paintings look pretty boring. They just like blue paintings. But if you sit there, I promise you, if you go to the Rothko Chapel and really have the discipline to sit still for 15 minutes, something really amazing happens with these paintings. They begin to move around. They don't literally move around, but your perception changes profoundly. Rothko Chapel is an amazing place. So Johannes Itten, we talked about with his Begegnung, was the father of modern color theory. But at the Bauhaus in 1919, he combined his color theory with his interest in metaphysics, his interest in yoga. He basically shows the seven chakras uh, associated with yoga practice. But he also connects the cubism, which was suddenly getting to be really popular in Europe, with his metaphysical idea that color is connected to spiritual reality. So that leads us to the type of, to the concept of archetypes, which is what we're gonna really talk about today. Um, archetypes are signifiers of universal meaning. Carl Jung is the psychologist, psycho psychoanalyst, um, actually a rival of Sigmund Freud in the early 20th century. And he said, basically, archetypes are the psychic equivalent of instincts. The contents of collective unconscious, the collective unconscious, that's a big concept. Uh, the contents of the collective unconscious are archetypes, primordial images that reflect basic patterns that are common to us all and in which have existed universally and which have existed universally since the dawn of time. That's a lot. That's a pretty big concept to get your head around. The squaring of the circle is one of the many archetypal motifs which form the basic patterns of our dreams and our fantasies. But it is distinguished by the fact that it is one of the most important of them from the functional point of view. Indeed, it could be called, it could even be called the archetype of wholeness. He's talking about the circle and the cross. And this is a symbol that pops up in pretty much every culture. It's used in Native American art. It's used in Christian art, in Judaic art. Uh, it becomes a, a sign of transcending everyday reality. What are archetypes? Most people, when they think about archetypes, they think about personality types. Archetypes are symbolic images we, sim we unconsciously understand. And these are what they are, the caregiver, the ruler, the creator, the sage. These are sometimes talk, called literary archetypes. If you read a novel or a story of any kind, you'll find all of these characters are in any good uh, piece of fiction. You'll also find them in the mythology, the stories that are told around the campfire or around the dinner table of every culture on the, on the planet. There are no exceptions. There are no cultures that don't have a sense of a ruler, a caregiver, a lover, a regular guy or gal, a hero, a rebel, an innocent, a sage. Sometimes the sage is male and sometimes the sage is female in which she's called a crone. Crone just means a woman who's no longer having her menstrual periods. The tarot cards. Maybe some of you have had your fortunes told by a tarot card reader. And it's really fun. You can go and have, they lay out these cards and each of the cards has meanings because they're based on archetypes. And by interpreting the cards in a certain way, 
it's believed that the tarot card reader can predict your future. I don't know if I believe in that, but it's fun. It's an interesting thing to do. And it's a really kind of systematic way to think about your life, to think about what's gonna be happening in the future. If the magician comes up and you think about it in terms of your future, the magician is about transformation. The fool, everybody, nobody wants to be a fool. It's sort of this idiot with a dog humping his leg. It's a really funny image, but it's really about letting go of taking yourself seriously. Um, the queen of swords, the ace of cups, the queen of pentacles, all of the symbols in these cards have special archetypal significance. Cultural archetypes, myth and symbol, Jungian archetypes, put a context on those myths and symbols. And his idea of archetypes are that we have a self who we think we are. We have a persona, which is how we act, how we're seen, a shadow, the part we don't want to face. Somebody could be really, really good and they may have a really dark shadow to them, a secret they don't want anybody to know about. And then finally, he says, we all have an anima or an animus. He has a male and female version of the soul. And he says, everybody has both of them in different proportions, different times of our lives. The anima is more important or the animus is very important. And that he says is who we really are. So by the end of the class, I'm gonna ask you to write a paper and it just has one question. Who are you? Who do you think you are? Who do other people think you are? What's your shadow? What's your spirit? Where do you fit in? Those are really important questions. Art doesn't matter. Answering those questions does. And art is an amazingly good way to find out the answers to those questions. Finally, the visual archetypes that we're talking about are the circle, the square, the triangle, the cross, and the spiral. Here, the archetypes are slightly different. It replaces the spiral with the star, which some people do, but the star you can actually see sort of symbolically as being like a spiral. Spiral comes out of the center of the star and it begins to symbolize the archetype of spirit, of sovereignty, but also of dynamism, of making things happen. The cross, here is shown as being about power, authority, strength, focus, and will, but it's also about paradox. It's also about getting to the center of the cross where the X and the Y come together in the middle, where the middle is neither X nor Y, and paradoxically, 100% X and 100% Y. It is both the thing and its opposite. And that has all kinds of symbolic significance in art. The circle is about the sky, about infinity, about wholeness, about love and perfection. The square is about stability and rigidity. Um, sometimes people think of the circle as being about mother and square as being about father. Uh, the triangle is about, the upturned triangle is about the male principle. The downturn triangle is the female principle. When you put them together, you get the star of David, the symbol of Judaism and the origins that most Jews don't even really think about when they think about the Star of David, they just think it's like the logo for, for Judea, Judaism or Judaica. Uh, but it really goes back to the origins of the Jewish religion, which has to do with balancing the opposites of life. It's written in a book that most Jews will never read called the Kabbalah. Everybody reads the Torah, everybody reads the Talmud, but the Kabbalah really talks about the significance of the Star of David and also things like the Tree of Life. So the idea of these spiritual archetypes can be used to give meaning to your artwork. The mandorla or the vesica is a really great symbol. What takes the symbol of the circle combined with another circle, two separate things come together and what you've got in the middle is the Venn diagram. Everybody knows about Venn diagrams. Here's one set and here's another set and here's the mixed set. Um, a couple of you are math majors, and this is really an important basic essential of calculus um, set theory. In Christian art, that vesica, 
that mandorla, the intersection of two circles comes together and you've got Jesus in the middle. Well, one of the circles is God and one of the circles is man. And if you do a Venn diagram of God and man, you get JC, you get Jesus. So the idea of these archetypes is used as early as, well, back to cave paintings ultimately to convey a sense of meaning. But here you've got Christ floating in the apse of San Vitale. You've got the equal lateral cross at the top and you've got the equilateral cross right at the center of his head. They all symbolize the resolution of paradox, the paradox of being both God and man. Here's Christ on the cross. Interesting thing that that vertical cross that we so associate with Christianity doesn't really show up in art history until about 1100 AD, uh, long after the beginning of Christianity. Christianity prior to this was about the divinity of Jesus Christ his wisdom and his teachings. In the Ottonian period of the medieval Europe, they begin to put a lot of emphasis on guilt, the idea that Christ died for our sins and we owe him his, our lives because he sacrificed himself for us to be cleansed. It's still a really important part of Christianity. It always has been, but the idea of the vertical cross as the archetype of Christianity is a fairly new one. Here's the original one, the equilateral cross with a jewel at the center, the part that's magical where X and Y are the same thing, are metaphors. They become symbols of who Jesus really was. <clears throat> the crucifixion of, of Christ by Sandro Martini shows Christ on the cross, exaggerated, the proportions are off, it doesn't matter. What matters is he's dying on the cross and the cross is an archetype. There's a triangle above that symbolizes the male principle and the idea of ascension. He's heading up. At the bottom is death. He's transcending, literally transcending death. And here, even though everybody else is painted kind of not very realistically, there's this very realistic skull at a time when the Europeans are just remembering how to paint realistically again. This is how they'd been painting for years. Uh, by the time they did Christ Pancreator at St. Catherine's in Egypt, uh, they were beginning to get past the realistic depiction of the figure and really beginning to do almost cartoon imagery, which we call Romanesque or Maniera Greca. But the cross is still there. The circle is still there. The ideas of Christ as being expressed by these archetypes is really, really important. The cathedral at Saint-Semain in Toulouse in France is typical of a Romanesque cathedral where those principles of archetypes get to be hugely important. The idea that the X and the Y axis or what the entire church is based on gets to be the theme for almost all Christian architecture after the Hagia Sophia that we talked about in Istanbul. This is Western Christian architecture. And the idea is that if you go to the center of the cross, something magical happens. X and Y, if you're sitting here, X is X and Y is Y. Here, X is Y and Y is X, but they're separate. But here, they're joined together. And among other things, this begins to be the place where the whole cathedral was built for just one activity, only one thing. And that's the transubstantiation. The ritual for all Christians is to go and eat a piece of unleavened bread and drink a little bit of red wine and believe to know that that's the blood and flesh of Jesus Christ. Well, anybody who knows anything knows that it's a piece of bread and it's a piece of, it's a cup of, of wine. And at best, it's just a poetic metaphor. It's a way of sort of thinking about things in symbolic terms. But when they started building these cathedrals, the idea was to really allow the bread to be flesh and the wine to be blood. It's real blood and it's real flesh. Here, it's just a, a poetic metaphor. But here, where a thing can be, it's the thing it is and the opposite of what it is at the same time. 
becomes possible. So these are meditation machines. These are machines that allow us to transcend and ascend at the same time. We go up just at the bottom. In the bottom of this, this cathedral is where Johnny and Susie are eating the, the bread and drinking the wine and ascending to God. They are meditation machines. And they use those archetypes to convey that meaning. In the Renaissance, in the Northern Renaissance, they started using the archetype of the triangle, the cross here and X. And this is a really important painting because it uses these implied lines, these lines that aren't actually drawn, but they're implied because of the way that the shapes line up with each other. It's a really important concept. And here, the marriage of Arnold Fini gets to be a really important painting, not just because it's really, really realistic. This guy's face is really his face. This woman's face is really a perfect portrait. Early art historians, when I first saw this painting, the art historian said, no, no, she looks pregnant, but she's not. That's just the way they painted back then. Well, they've done a lot of research and they've finally come to a conclusion that, yeah, she's really pregnant and they're about to get married. So she's about eight months pregnant at the wedding day, but it wasn't considered an immoral thing because church and weddings weren't generally considered for most people to be connected. For kings and queens or dukes or, or major nobles, the church was involved in the wedding. Sometimes for regular people, they were too, but mostly weddings during the time of the Renaissance in the 1400s was a pretty informal operation that had to do with sharing wealth, with having names for your children, uh, with inheritance rights, all of those things became implied, but they were just legal contracts. This painting becomes remarkable because these two figures, and there's some controversy about who they actually were, but it's pretty clear that they were historical figures. Arnold Fini, we think, was an investment banker from Italy who was marrying a woman uh, who may have also been from Italy, may, she may also have been from Belgium, depends on who you read. But in the back, there's a mirror that shows the backs of these two figures and behind them in the mirror is reflected this guy, Jan van Eyck and two other people. And it's signed, not this was painted by Jan van Eyck. It says Jan van Eyck was here. It's a wedding contract, it's a marriage license. It's an acknowledgement that Arnold Fini and his bride got married. Here, the center of the image is them holding hands. And the archetypes, all of the implied lines and shapes all support the fact that this is the most important part of the painting. It's not his face or her face, it's the joining of the two. Really, really major breakthrough for art. Again, about... <laughs> 500 years later, we have the American artist, Grant Wood, who knows this main, amazing painting. How many people have seen this before? I'm, I'm assuming that most of you have seen some image of this. I mean, there was a TV show about green acres and they made fun of this picture. It's painted by Grant Wood, who's an American realist painter. And it uses archetypes, the triangle pointing up, the triangle pointing down, and this image that keeps repeating, the three in one, it's the Holy Trinity. And now transposed to American folklore, this guy is holding a pitchfork. Well, who else holds a pitchfork? He not only is holding it, but he's got it repeated. That same shape is repeated in the bib of his overalls. And the, story, the question is what's being depicted here? When the sister of Grant Wood who posed for this woman was at the opening, somebody complimented her on, oh, you must be very proud to be seen as the farmer's wife in this painting. And she got mad and she said, no, no, no. This guy, the guy who posed for the farmer was, was Grant's dentist and he's about 50 years old. He's an old man and I'm only 25. I'm not married to him, I'm his daughter. So this she said was about his daughter and running away from home. He's looking at us like, don't you dare. If you come here, I've got my pitchfork. I'm gonna protect my daughter's virtue. Lots of jokes about the farmer's daughter, traveling salesman jokes. But he's looking diabolical and like he has a real attitude. 
I would not like to argue with this guy, especially when he's holding a pitchfork. But her, she's looking over here somewhere. She's far away. She's getting ready to R U N N O F T. She's getting ready to run away. So here, there's this wonderful painting that shows the paradox of Christian virtue, the three in one, everybody's going up to heaven, but also the dark side, the sinister side of rural American life. It's a very interesting painting, but it uses those archetypes to say something that's, that's unusual, that's weird. The archetypes were used by Grunewald. Matthias Grunewald in 1537 used these archetypes, the cross, the triangles, the rectangles, and it's a closed altarpiece. When you basically walk in, it's about eight feet wide, and all of these panels, all painted with oil paint on wood panels, are closed. And as you go in, they open up, and each of the inside panels show different aspects of Christianity. You notice as you get close to this Jesus that his arms and legs are really exaggerated. His hands are way too big, his arms are way too long, but his hands express pain. Those hands are racked in agony. This is not Christ saying, oh yeah, this is a, a, not a good way to spend Easter. This is Christ on the cross suffering, really suffering. His face looks agonized. And if you look really closely, you'll see that his body is covered with little zits. Those same little zits we saw in those girls in that medieval illuminated manuscript. Well, Christ in this painting is dying of the plague. 1537 was the midst of one of the last great, really awful plagues of Europe. And people came to the church in Isenheim not to be cured of the plague. Everybody knew that 80% of the people who got it were gonna be dead in about a week. So you come in on your last legs and you don't wanna see a happy Jesus, you're suffering. You're getting ready to die. You want Jesus literally to feel your pain. Here, Mary Magdalene, here, one of the apostles, I'm not sure which one, here, St. Sebastian, the patron saint of Germany, Pope Leo, and John, this is John the Baptist uh, pointing to this guy. And in the background, it says something really curious. It says, he increases as I diminish. It's a very strange cryptic saying. You open up this mysterious object, and there in the right panel, right behind this painting here, is this painting and it shows Jesus having died as you are about to do because you have the plague. And like Jesus, it promises that you too will turn into a ball of light. Your form will be dissolved into light. That's a really big concept. Dissolving form into light is something that's right at the center of Christian mysticism depicted here by using the circle and the triangle to be metaphors for Christian experience. Here, another use of symbolism by Arnold Brooklyn, a Swiss painter in the late 1800s who uses the triangle here. There's a triangle implied here and a rectangle here. What is he talking about? What is being symbolized here? Well, somebody in one of my classes pointed this out and I, I actually read up on it. And yeah, there was a whole analysis of this painting. Apparently he did eight of these paintings, different variations of the theme, but it was a very popular theme. Here's this little figure, somebody who's died wrapped in a shroud, being ferried across the river Styx by the ferry boatman, returning to this island through this very curious looking square gate. As you enter, you get a little grove of trees and you get these two white outcroppings. And one of the women in my class said, oh, I can't believe what he's doing here. Look at the real symbolism. Look at childbirth. If you ever have witnessed a childbirth, what you see is two knees that are up in the air, legs spread apart with a bush, with the pubic area symbolized here by a gate. And this is ultimately about the return of the spirit to the mother. After you die, you'd return symbolically to the mother. You'd go back, we all go back where we came from. So it's like, it's a reverse of human birth. And it's that triangle 
these triangles and this square, all symbolizing birth and death. Same here, Edvard Munch's famous painting, The Scream. It's about the same thing. You get this funny little figure that is screaming, but it's, it's not meant to make a picture of somebody screaming. It's meant to be a scream. This whole painting is a scream. It conveys the desperation, the fear, the terror, the anxiety of what a scream is with this face, but also with this downturn triangle. The figure is penetrating the downturn triangle. Above, we have these pink clouds that look almost terrifying. But again, we have that sense of dread, but we also have the sense of sublime. In the Renaissance, in the Northern Renaissance, Peter Bruegel used the triangle to just make fun of the landscape. This is a landscape that has hundreds, literally hundreds of triangles in it. How many can you see? Here's a triangle between his legs. She's wearing a triangular hat. He's having fun with the archetype of the triangle. And what it does is it directs your eye all the way through the composition. Wherever there's a triangle, you see it as when we use an arrow. An arrow depicts directionality. So if you want to move somebody's eye around the canvas, just put a bunch of triangles. Circles. Raphael did this image of the Madonna as a tondo. You don't need to remember that a circular painting is called a tondo. But here, Raphael uses the circular canvas as a way to make a composition that's not based on triangles. It's not based on horizontal lines that are nice and orderly. Everything in here is an arc, a curve, a spiral. There's a spiral that goes out like that. There's a spiral that goes like this. There are two spirals intertwining each other. Wonderfully sensuous, wonderfully loving, a perfect metaphor for Christian faith. And again, we've got symbolically the Virgin Mary, the mother, the caregiver, the hero. Jesus is the hero, the archetype of the hero. And here, John the Baptist is basically his assistant, somebody who sees him and recognizes him for who he really is, but it's all done as a composition of circles, of spirals, of arcs and curves. The biggest circle in the world, five times a day, people bow down to this place in Mecca. When everybody in Islam bows down to Mecca at the same time, they form a circle, a circle that's as big as the planet. People don't think of it that way. People think of Islam as being the sort of exotic religion from the Middle East, but it is worldwide. There are Muslims on every continent and five times a day when they bow down, they simply make a circle. There are only three things required of people who are Muslims. One is to bow down five times a day. The other one is to go eventually to Mecca and pay homage, to go and walk around this stone that's inside of a big square building and say there is no God but God and Muhammad is his prophet. You have to say that and really mean it at least once in your life. The other part is you have to follow the teachings of the Quran which are to be merciful and to be generous and to be um, faithful. All really good things to be but it's all about the interconnecting pattern, the geometry of the world isn't seen as a sign of God, it is God, that is Allah. This is an Islamic sacred symbol and it's the same as the Jewish sacred symbol, the star of David, the male and the female intertwined, surrounded by all of these triangular shapes pointing outwards is a tool that's used in a mosque in Iraq, excuse me, Iran uh, for Sufis, people who are members of a secret group of esoteric metaphysical Muslims uh, who practice a form of yoga. Here the cross inside of a circle becomes, it's the symbol that Jung talked about in that, in that little sort of illustration. It's an early Christian basilica and it shows Christ not nailed to a cross, it shows Christ, we know he's Christ because he's got the little halo and the cross behind his head, right underneath the cross 
and he's got sheep. He's the shepherd. He's not the guy who's dying for our sins. He's the guy who's leading us to lie down in still pastures. He is the loving protector of humans. It's only later that he's actually seen as being nailed to that cross. Right now, the cross is still the archetypal sign of his divinity, the fact that he is both God and man. In Japan, they have a very different use of the, of the circle. It's still as sacred as the Christian circle, but here it's a part of meditation. And in Zen Buddhism, where they teach you how to meditate, you basically sit sometimes for hours on end. You sit and you sit and you sit until you're thinking of nothing. You literally, your mind goes completely blank and you're aware that you're sitting there. You're aware of your breath. But when you have no thoughts, at that moment, you're taught to pick up a paintbrush with lots of ink. You load your brush with ink and then quickly you make in one gesture this circle. It's called an Enzo. And if you are truly successful as a meditator, your spirit will be so balanced and so even that your circle will come out exactly perfect. If you're thinking of something else, if you're not really being clear, the circle will be a little off. This one actually is a little off, but it's the idea of making the circle in one gesture without hesitation. That's a sign of pure spiritual awareness. Here's a circle used by the pop artist Jasper Johns in 1955, and it's a target, but it's also the archetype of the circle. And it's playing with the archetype as something which is both sacred and kind of funny and profane. Five, four images of the artist's face inside of a, a wooden cabinet, and then this target of circles basically focusing on the artist, the target with four faces four faces individually targeted are a symbol of not spirituality, but of paranoia. Andy Goldsworthy created a circle by going out into a, he would camp for like weeks at a time. And here he was camping by a lake in Scotland and decided that he would go out early in the morning. He traveled to make art, but he only carried a, a pair of shears, a knife and a camera. And early, early in the morning, he cut all of these twigs, these sticks, and he's got the center focus of this image. The horizon is actually right there. There's a line that goes right through this composition. And what you're looking at is the reflection of sticks stuck into very shallow water on a very, very calm pond. So it goes like right through here. No, that's wrong. It's this. But basically he creates a circle that's really only a half circle and he lets the reflection and the still water be the other part of the composition. The spiral is used in art all the time. The reversed image of Leonardo da Vinci is, I don't know how it got reversed in this, but I'll have to fix it. Um, the spiral actually is based on the mathematical relationship of one to 1.618, also known as the golden section or the Fibonacci numbers. There's a mystical connection between that particular mathematic expression and this particular kind of spiral that is used clearly by Leonardo to create a sense of humanity to the proportions of the Mona Lisa. Here, 500 years later, uh, George Bellows uses it to show stags at Starkey's about American life. These two boxers make an absolutely beautiful connection. It shows the dynamism. It looks like two elephants crashing into each other. But that dynamism of the spiral is what gets it moving. We talked about Myron's discus thrower and how that spiral at the center of his abdomen spins out and gives us the weird illusion that he's about to let go with that, that discus. Goldsworthy again, going out into nature and finding just random stuff and placing it in 
arrangements, taking a picture and then letting nature blow it back away. Most of Andy Goldsworthy's artworks only last about 15 minutes and then they blow away, they get walked on. They're not sacred objects. They're sacred ideas that are captured with the camera. Nobody's quite sure whether this artist is a sculptor or a conceptual artist or a photographer or a painter. Nobody quite knows, Nobody. he sort of defies um, categorization, but his work is wildly popular. Bruce Connor was a pop artist, actually a California funk artist, the West Coast version of, of pop art. But here he did this neon sculpture at a time when he was doing a lot of neon artwork. And what he wrote is really interesting. It's called, it's, it says, the true artist helps the world by revealing mystic truth. And at the time, everybody said, huh? What's that supposed to mean? It was pop art and people were supposed to be cool and aloof. And he said, ah, oh, that's just something I made up. It's just ironic. And later, now he's in his seventies and he says, no man, I really believe that. I really think that artists, real artists, true artists do help the world by revealing mystic truth. So next week we'll talk about mandalas and how taking those archetypes and putting them on top of each other really creates sacred architecture. Uh, so with that, I will stop sharing and stop recording. There we go.